Hi everybody. In the first discussion this week, you are asked to <clears throat> excuse me. You're asked to examine what you think Walter Cronin would believe about um, the way that wilderness is expressed in Bambi and other Disney films. Then you're supposed to reflect on aspects of it, Disney films and whether or not you agree or disagree with the idea that they represent um, <clears throat> that they represent nature in its truth uh, or nature through the lens of some sort of distorted image. And um, I think this is an interesting question and and perhaps maybe we should be a bit more specific. You know, Cronin talks about wilderness, not necessarily nature. Wilderness <clears throat> might, the word nature has multiple meanings and definitions and one might include the world, uh, the biosphere, you know, ecological systems. But there are other, there's another definition of nature in the sense of something's essence, right? That for which it exists. It's, it's nature. A lot of people believe that humans have, have a nature. Um, a lot of people would say that there's a dog nature and a cat nature and a deer nature and an insect nature. <clears throat> Others would reject that idea. Um, those who reject the idea of, of a human nature even or of a specific nature for for types of animals usually believe that um, that there's not some ultimate end for which those creatures have been created so often atheists and agnostics um, at least philosophers have rejected the idea that there is a human that there's even such a thing as a human nature <clears throat> um, while others um, might find human nature in reason, right? So the rational faculties of the human mind. And a lot of people express concepts of wilderness in relation to humanity, of course, and in relation to reason. Uh, they say things like animals are wild because they don't think that the same way, uh, the same way that, that humans do. Um, but as, as was mentioned in our discussion board this week, it's important to remember that humans perhaps might be the most wild of all animals um, in a certain sense. Uh, of course, animals kill, uh, and often violently, or what appears to us to be violent. But we kill, and we kill actually to a much greater extent than animals do. We kill billions of animals uh, every year. Um, for food consumption, but we also kill each other. So, in another sense, uh, humans are quite wild and beastly when when they're battling one another, and uh, we're capable of doing extremely crazy things to one another. Uh, and we often forget that because you know many of us dwell in relatively comfortable surroundings, and we have safety nets. Uh, you know, police forces and military forces that we feel comfortable with. Um, but we forget that it's only a hop, skip, and a jump till we become wild, right? Like, for example, you know, I'm sure we've all had the experience where, you know, everything is fine, we're driving along, and then uh, somebody all of a sudden is driving seven miles an hour in front of us, and, and you just can't control yourself. You're behind the wheel just screaming at the person, right? Like, get out of the way! What's your problem? And maybe you don't, maybe you use some other words, right, as you are expressing yourself and your frustration and those things. So the human can become quite wild um, just at the drop of a hat. You know, somebody bumps into you at a bar or something, right? And what happens? It's like, no, oh, come on, man. You No, what's your problem? You know, like, oh, you want to fight? You're right. Like, we immediately go to these aggressive responses uh, when really what happened when, you know, somebody's shoulder bumped yours or perhaps the person in front of you is just, you know, taking their time and, and what's wrong with taking time, right? But apart from that, in relation to the, the, the discussion itself, I want you guys to think about uh, what wilderness actually is. And of course, Cronin has his um, views of what wilderness can be and the fact that it kind of exists everywhere and that wilderness is that which the human can see once the human takes on a specific perspective. Um, but he also does kind of a genealogy of the concept of wilderness where he critiques, examines and critiques traditional views of wilderness, so, you know, the whole idea that one escapes the evils of civilization, you know, out in 
uh, the Grand Canyon, right, or climbing a mountain, that, that I can only have authentic wilderness experiences when I separate myself from humanity, when I get out of my car, uh, when I turn off my telephone, right? And even now, wilderness itself is impenetrated by the telephone, not only the phones that everybody's carrying around or even playing music on, um, but many mountains now and hills have literally the cell phone towers on them because, of course, you know, you need the highest spot so you can ping the messages or the relays um, between towers. Uh, and so those components are becoming part of the landscape itself. Um, but at the same time, I want you guys to think also about the readings, the readings from our textbook, uh, the this, this Sacred Earth. Um, because these, these readings also relate to um, the concept of wilderness and, and the way that humans define nature. And I really like this passage from John Muir uh, on, from the Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf, where he's saying that most of us tend to believe that the earth was kind of created for humanity. Uh, to use. Now, even, even if you're not religious um, and you don't believe that it was necessarily created by something else, still we live a mode of existence where um, nature and the earth is kind of like just a huge mass of resources. So a mountain is, is not considered a mountain. It, it's considered um, a reserve of uh, that like coal, right, or or the um, the petroleum dirt or whatever that they're harvesting, like in Canada, um, where they're literally just kind of like taking away mountains because they're full of this like you know soil that has petroleum in it, and then they extract the petroleum. Um, everything becomes a resource, and and even the um, animals, right? So. Even if you don't inherently believe that the Earth was created for the sole purpose of humanity, the the way what we've done as humans is is use the Earth in such a way that that it benefits us. And so, um, you know, we we factory farm animals because we need food, and a pig becomes uh, no longer a, an interesting creature in itself, um, a foraging kind of like strange thing out in the wild with hair and tusks and stuff it, it just becomes a food source it becomes bacon it becomes ham it becomes um what's the pork belly right the stuff that all these little like american uh, shops are putting on everything right now <clears throat> these new american style <clears throat> restaurants they put pork belly on everything you know like pork belly ice cream pork belly uh uh salad <clears throat> pork belly pork belly, pork belly ham, and we're like, wow, you know, that is not a pig, that thing looks delicious. <clears throat> but um, even down to different types of minerals, right, like um, silicon has become extremely important for technology. Uh, diamonds, right, um, are, if we think about it, a diamond is just a tiny little rock that's clear. Uh, but what a diamond represents for us is, is obviously much more. Um, and so we, we, we turn everything in nature into a resource, one to be extracted. Um, and a lot of people blame religion, right? Specifically the, Christ, uh, the Christian religion because, you know, in the Bible it says, you know, God says, you know, in Genesis that, that humanity is the master of all creation. Um, master might not be the best word, perhaps caretaker is a better word, uh, but that's kind of been translated into the idea that we can master the animals, that we can rule the earth, that we can uh, subjugate it to our own desires, and, and of course that's part of it in our society. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, capitalism in itself is, a, a, I would say, a more prominent driving force in the uh, commodification of nature, right? Because, um, you know, like once you're able to harvest aluminum from rocks, uh, then all you don't care about the rock in itself, you don't care about the mountain, you care about the fact that you can make thousands and thousands of dollars by extracting this, this metal. <clears throat> um, 
and uh, and it's not based on your religious views per se, but it's more based on the system that you know. You know, this kind of ethos in America where we, we love digging in the ground and finding these resources and then like utilizing them and selling them and, and of course there's something inherently I would say good about the fact that humans desire and enjoy uh, to create, to harvest and to to utilize resources in such a way that they can um, create something better for humanity um, now, not all of our creations create something better. Many of them are quite absurd, you know, like a, a fake talking parrot, you know, who needs one of those? Um, but other things that we've been able to extract, for example, bioactive compounds from different types of plants, right? Um, that we then figure out, wow, this is, this is really useful and this, you know, you know, helps people who are suffering, right, from these different um, ailments. Now, of course, there are other types of biochemical compounds extracted from plants, right? Like um, like heroin and uh, cocaine and um, marijuana uh, that then have to be regulated because people, in, it, they help so much that they end up not helping, right? Um, <clears throat> but, but part of what we, of all of this is the idea that humans, and in Muir's piece, um, you know, we tend to think of God and, and nature as um, like we're like God, right? So we are made in God's image, and and so God obviously is like us, and so we can think, so God can think, so God thinks like better than us, right? Because it's God and it made us. Um, but we also tend to think things like, uh, as he mentions, that God is kind of this Democrat with these um, progressive ideas about things, um, and that. And that, of course, God loves us and our society more than God does others because they are heathens who worship other types of gods, and those gods are wrong. And, of course, they feel the same way about us, you know. Um, they believe that our gods are wrong and that theirs are right. Um, but the, the danger in making God h human is that we all make God what we are, subjectively. Um, and the Earth seems to... We, uh, Muir points out that we turn a blind eye to what the earth offers us. Because if we look at the earth, what we see is, is not a God who um, appears to be very just, uh, or at least a creation that emanated from this being. Of course, there's, you know, you know, you don't have to believe that God created everything, you know. It could all just be, you know, the result of natural processes and kind of the Big Bang. Um, but remember that God could have used the Big Bang to create the universe, too. And those two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. But um, uh, but even even most people who, who don't believe in God still kind of have concepts of justice, and, and they wish that the world were... Or they want to, the world to align with those concepts. But when we look at nature, we see some really horrible stuff, right? Like the lion doesn't kill the strongest gazelle, you know, the lion kills the, the little, you know, deformed baby gazelle that can't run as fast, right? The lion eats the, the elderly wildebeest, the one that can't quite get away, or the one that's missing a leg or a foot, you know, that doesn't seem very right. Uh, you can imagine, in our society, um, well, <laughs> we did this for hundreds of years, and, and humans have done this for thousands of years, but uh, you can imagine now if we took disabled people in our society um, and we kind of destroyed them simply because they were weaker physically, you know, they can't help it, right? Um, but they are. Um, you can imagine if we took mentally disabled children and we just got rid of them, which uh, of, we did in different ways and humans have throughout society done so. Um, but now we have different views. We, we tend to think that people who are disabled are important in society and that our society ought to adapt itself such that those people can have at least similar opportunities to those who have luckily been born with fully functional bodies and minds. Um, but nature doesn't seem to function that way. Nature seems to function such that the weak are the ones precisely who are destroyed first. Um, <clears throat> And uh, and if we look at that, that's that's not a democratic uh, creator, right? That's not a um, 
like Muir says, a proper Englishman, you know, who believes in limited government and all these things. Um, and then there are other things that we see in nature, and I just wanted to read this passage uh, from the Muir. Uh, he says, but what if we should ask these profound expositors of God's intentions, uh, how about those man-eating animals, lions, tigers, and alligators, which smack their lips over raw man? Or about those myriads of noxious insects that destroy labor and drink his blood? Doubtless man, or humanity, was intended for food and drink for all of these, no? <clears throat> so, if we're going to say that that humans were created to dominate nature, then logically we would need to respond by saying that if God created an animal that destroyed humans, then that precisely nature would be such that we are the food, right? Because we are, in certain cases, we are the food. Um, or, uh, you know, you know, he brings up here like the mosquito that drinks our blood, right? Maybe the mosquito is the highest form of being, and God made mosquitoes, um, God ma just made humans because he knew that, um, that mosquitoes needed humans to survive, right? Um, that's kind of an interesting thought, right? Like, like George Carlin said, um, God didn't make humans uh, to rule the earth or anything like that. Uh, God doesn't love humans, God loves plastic. But the only way that, the, that plastic could be on the earth would be if humans created plastic. So God had to create humans so that plastic could exist, and then um, God's going to kill off all the humans, and then plastic will be here forever, right? Because it doesn't biodegrade. Well, of course it does, but it takes a long time. So, But anyway, the point of the joke is that um, when you take this kind of like reverse perspective on things, you see kind of the place of humanity drop a bit, right? And what if it is the case that, that all humans are, or all uh, nature is created equal? Like, if God does exist, it could be the case that that um, God doesn't love us any more than God loves trees or insects or plants or even the soil itself. Um, we can't certainly know that we are placed in a higher position. Of course, all of our religious texts say that we are, but it might just be the mere fact that we have this special brain um, that allows us to think differently. And of course, something that comes out of that brain is the idea that we're more important than every other animal. Um, that God loves us more because God has given us more of a capacity. Um, but in another sense, God has given birds the capacity to fly. I mean, wouldn't you like to fly? I know I would. I would love to fly around. It's awesome. So in that sense, birds have like way more of a, a move. I mean, of, of most animals, humans have like the most limited movement. Um, you know, we celebrate uh, people who can run nine second, 100 meter dashes. But, you know, my Boston Terrier can do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, if you can, if you have like a 35 inch vertical leap, uh, you're, you're doing pretty well. 40 inches, you're, you can jump, right? Well, a cricket can jump 10 feet in the air, right? An animal this big. So if we were to actually do the, the numbers on that, if, if we were that big, we'd be jumping like millimeters, right? And we'd be like, wow, you can really jump. Um, but a cricket could basically like jump over like a hundred story building if it were as big as, as we are. Um, even in the water, we swim like two miles an hour. You know, a tiny little fish it just goes away, right? So there are capacities that other animals have that we don't have, that, that if, if there is a God and God has created nature, it seems like God has given a higher capacity for other functions to other animals. They can see better, they can hear better, uh, they're more agile, they're more adapted to their surroundings. Imagine trying to live out in the wild in a Midwestern winter. I mean, we would all freeze to death, right? But that's precisely what all the deer do, uh, what all the squirrels do, what all the raccoons do, uh, what all the mice do, what all the, you know, the insects do well. Some of them lay eggs and then they die, and then the next generation comes up. Um, but Muir, I really like this passage here because uh, he talks about he gets us to think about our place in nature, and uh, and thinking about why are there so many things, so many minerals that poison us, right? Why are there so many plants and fish that are deadly enemies of humans? Uh, why? Uh, 
is the human subjected to the same laws of life as all of our subjects, right? Like, why do we all die and get cancer and, and suffer? Um, and then he says, oh, all these things are satanic. Here, Mira is taking on the, the opposite position. Uh, or in some way connected with the first garden. So, yeah. So, humans tend to interpret things like, yeah, okay, there are animals that kill us. But it's our fault, right? Like, we send... And that's why sharks eat us. You know, we sin, that's why we have to plow the earth, and it doesn't just spring forth with fruits and vegetables. Um, but for Muir, that's not a very convincing argument. Um, and then he says, but now it never seems to occur to these far-seeing teachers, these people who claim that it, you know, it's the fault of humanity, that nature's object in making animals and plants might possibly be, first of all, the happiness of each one of them, not just of humans. Not the creation of all for the happiness of one, just for humanity. Why should man, or humanity, value itself as more than a small part of the one great unit of creation? And what creatures of all that the Lord has taken the pains to make is not essential to the completeness of that unit, the cosmos? The universe would be incomplete without man. But it would also be incomplete without the smallest transmicroscopic creature that dwells beyond our conceitful eyes and knowledge. So here, and it does appear that Muir has some ideas about God, that God exists and that God has created. But he doesn't believe that humans occupy a special position in relation to nature and that God. He also asks us to think about the fact that it's not only the world that suffers when humanity dies. We tend to think that, right? Like, one of humanity's greatest fears is that we'll all wipe, out, wipe each other out in a holocaust of some sort, probably nuclear. Um, or maybe some meteorite will come and hit the Earth and kill all of us. But the thing is, life will persist. We tend to think that if all humans died, then all life would die. But as you've seen from different movies and zombies and things, um, all of humanity can get wiped out. There will still be bugs, there'll still be bacteria, there'll still probably be small animals, uh, insects, uh, I guess I said that. Things in the ocean will survive, um, and then life will regenerate. It's happened before, multiple times. You know, there were these things called dinosaurs that existed on Earth, and there were not humans, and there weren't uh, mammals or anything, or pro there were proto-mammals, I guess. Um, and then all of a sudden, everything got wiped out. And then life sprang up again in this new form, right? Sprang up with like lions and tigers and bears and humans and, and strange things like whales and, um, and all these different types of creatures. So w why do we think that if all of humanity is destroyed, or even all of life as we know it, that it might not reemerge again in a different form as it's done, you know, at least once in the history of the Earth? Um, uh, it could. There, you know, we could all get wiped out, and a new form of creature that we can't even imagine might pop up. I mean, no, no human, if if they had existed with dinosaurs, probably could have imagined uh, a horse, right? Um, well, I guess they had miniature horses too. Um, but you know, they they probably couldn't have imagined the way that life would emerge in these new creatures, like the ones that we see in the zoo, and you've never seen that type of animal before. Um, and you're like, what is that thing? Like, I, I, I had never even thought of it before because it's just so unique. Uh, but anyway, could it be that, uh, that nature and the world um, suffers not merely because of the loss of humanity or not merely because humans don't interact with nature and wilderness in a proper manner? Could it be that all of nature suffers uh, when even the smallest organisms uh, leave the earth? Um, could it be that the that, that mosquitoes are necessary and that actually if we were to kill them off, it would reverberate in other animal populations and cause more suffering and, and more of these things? Could it be that everything is necessary and uh, that to eliminate things that that are necessary is to, in a certain sense, um, suffer and uh, to harm nature. Well, anyway, uh, just some ideas uh, about the first discussion, but also about other themes for the week. Uh, I hope you found it useful, and I look forward to reading your responses. Remember, 
don't just do the bare minimum. Don't focus on word counts. Um, do the best you can. Speak until you're finished. Uh, complete your thoughts. Do your research uh, and uh, really read the text and try to gain that understanding that you can then take with you uh, in your future courses here at Ashford.